Turkey has developed its own vaccine called Turkovac. How effective is it? Welcome to this COVID-19 special on DW. Also on the show, Yulia Fergin gives us the rundown on the various coronavirus vaccines. How do they work? And how do they differ? But first, who are the unvaccinated? And what motivates them? We talk to a German woman who doesn't want to get vaccinated and even accepts the risk of dying of COVID-19. Today, Sabine Schröder is working as an alternative practitioner. She offers her patients homeopathy treatments. On other days, she works as a nurse in an intensive care unit. When the pandemic started, she volunteered in a COVID ward. Even local newspapers reported on the story. It is a smaller intensive care unit, but over 50% of it was occupied by coronavirus patients. During my shifts, I really experienced how desperately patients were struggling for air. That really got to me. From her own experience, she knows that the disease has cost many lives. However, she doesn't want to get vaccinated against COVID-19, even though it will be compulsory for healthcare workers in Germany from March. Instead of being vaccinated with a vaccine whose effect I can't assess, I'd rather catch the virus. Of course, that could go badly, but then I would rather accept death on my own terms. Lawmaker and doctor Paula Pichotta voted for compulsory vaccinations. She wants to prevent patients from being infected by nursing staff. For all of us working in healthcare, it is our job that we do not put our patients at unreasonable risk. And the COVID-19 vaccination is extremely safe, which is why it is acceptable to enforce it to protect our patients. Sabine believes in alternative therapy, not in vaccinations, despite all the scientific proof that they work. Most healthcare workers are vaccinated, but Sabine could now lose her clinical job. Should that really happen, and my employer would say, we are a danger to the patients, then I will accept that. Then I will not work there anymore. She would then be missing out on several hundred euros a month, but that won't change her mind. She says she will remain unvaccinated. Germany's health and care workers have priority for receiving the new Novavax vaccine, which is a protein subunit vaccine. Two years into the pandemic, there are now over 20 COVID vaccines on the market. How do they compare? Our reporter, Julia Fergin, has more. Perhaps we have all heard these terms before, mRNA, vector and inactivated vaccines, or maybe even protein subunit vaccines, such as the one from Novavax. But what distinguishes these vaccines from each other and how exactly do they work? What are the pluses and minuses? No idea? That's okay. We have prepared something for you. How does a protein subunit vaccine work? In the protein subunit vaccine, the surface proteins of SARS-CoV-2, known as spike proteins, are inoculated. In order for the body to recognize the spike proteins as a pathogen and something to defend against, active enhancers are added. The body produces antibodies against the spike proteins and thus neutralizes the virus. The effect enhancers, also called adjuvants, are part of every inactivated vaccine. They are called inactivated vaccines because the pathogen or the parts of the pathogen that are vaccinated are no longer capable of reproducing. What are the advantages of protein subunit vaccines? For people who do not want to be vaccinated with mRNA or vector vaccines, the Novavax vaccine may be an alternative. They are also easy to store and transport. What are the disadvantages of protein subunit vaccines? 
Protein subunit vaccines take a long time to produce. And with an infectious disease that spreads rapidly and globally, speed is key. Vector vaccines from AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson offer another option for immunization. How do vector vaccines work? These vaccines use a virus that is harmless to humans as a carrier to transport the genetic information of the corona spike protein. They introduce the blueprint of the spike protein into the body cells. Using this blueprint, the body cells then produce the spike themselves and in turn initiate an immune response in which antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 are formed. What are the advantages of vector vaccines? Vector vaccines are easy to adapt and can be produced quickly in large quantities. The combination of vector and mRNA vaccines, by the way, results in particularly good antibody production against SARS-CoV-2. What are the disadvantages of vector vaccines? The body's immune response may be directed against the harmless vector virus rather than the spike protein of the coronavirus. This weakens the effect of the vaccine. In addition, thrombosis may occur in rare cases. This is a side effect that mainly affects younger people. Against SARS-CoV-2, mRNA vaccines are in use for the first time. Here, too, the body must produce the spike protein of the coronavirus itself. How do mRNA vaccines work? The genetic information that is the blueprint for the spike is transported into the human cells as mRNA. The mRNA is coated with lipid substances, which ensure that the mRNA remains sufficiently stable and can finally be read out in the body cells and translated into the spike protein. This is followed by the immune response and the formation of the antibodies. What are the advantages of mRNA vaccines? One of the most significant advantages of mRNA vaccines is that they can be produced and customized very quickly in the lab. What are the disadvantages of mRNA vaccines? Many people remain unconvinced of the safety of this novel vaccine. Nevertheless, the technology is a great hope for science, also with regard to other diseases. More than 10 billion COVID vaccine doses have already been administered worldwide. But in many countries, especially in Africa, less than 10% of the population has been vaccinated. One reason is vaccine inequity, inadequate access to COVID vaccines, something that South Africa is determined to change. It's a first for the continent. This inconspicuous building in an industrial area of Cape Town is the base for Africa's only vaccine technology hub. With vaccines in short supply in Africa, the WHO and COVAX initiative led the drive to set up a local technology sharing platform. That's one of the positive legacies of COVID. We now, in the last eight months, have seen this, this, this massive funding available now for biotechnology in South Africa, in Cape Town and also in Africa. Afrigen is the company tasked with developing and producing affordable mRNA vaccines. These are relatively new but highly effective vaccines that so far only two major companies have commercialized, BioNTech and Moderna. BioNTech will start production of its vaccines in South Africa next year, so Afrigen was counting on cooperation with Moderna. The model was that we will receive a technology transfer, turnkey technology transfer, but that didn't happen. So the team now has jumped in with our university partners and the knowledge base in South Africa to develop our own vaccine. One of the key partners is in Johannesburg, the Antiviral Gene Therapy Research Unit at Witwatersrand University. They have been working on mRNA technology since 2015 as one of the only research units on the continent. They are now sharing their skills and knowledge with Afrigen. We have been able to take information which is available in the public domain to work out how the Moderna mRNA is produced. So we have the sequence and we have the context of that sequence which we've been able to reproduce. But of course, the purpose of that really is to use as a reference rather than as something which we want to try and uh, 
use as a, as a product. Um, so we would like to develop our own ideas and we are in fact doing that already and compare that to the Moderna vaccine. The team also has the job of developing a vaccine that is efficient against the new Omicron variant. Professor Abdullah Ali analyzes the sequences of Omicron cases that other laboratories discovered. We would be given a file such as this and uh, we will then have to make that into a physical DNA sequence. What we want to do is perhaps in, in a few months have something ready to be able to test in mice. Uh, once we know, once we have a candidate that we know works well, it is then uh, going to be to take that uh, to Afrigen and for them to translate this into something that uh, uh, can be produced at a much larger scale. This process includes clinical studies and will take years. Back in Cape Town, Pietro Terblanche is still hoping Moderna comes on board, as this would speed up the process. Moderna has announced a patent waiver while the pandemic is still ongoing, but afterwards no commercialization will be possible without its approval. We would like to have a voluntary license to be able to transfer this technology to other low and middle income countries to use the platform for other vaccines, HIV, TB, Ebola, flu. This hub and, and the capacity and the capability we're building here is, is, is beyond COVID. So this, this in fact is part of a strategy from, from Africa to produce 60% of our vaccines by 2040. So this is part of building an industry. Today, most vaccines used on the continent are imported. Afrigen and its partners aim to bring the first homegrown products to market within three years. Our DW Science correspondent, Derek Williams, has been monitoring developments since the beginning of the pandemic and answering your questions. If you're vaccinated or recently recovered, how long will this protection last? And what if you're vaccinated and recovered? YouTube viewer Seba has a question about that. How effective is hybrid immunity? Okay, before we go any further, uh, let's define this term. Um, last spring, researchers began reporting on a phenomenon that they'd spotted, which was that people who'd been infected with SARS-CoV-2 and then subsequently been vaccinated appeared afterwards to have kind of a, a turbocharged immune response to the virus with extremely high antibody levels. Um, they called it super immunity and it was often postulated that super immunity was the strongest longest lasting defense you could have against contracting the virus again or at least for a good long while then with the advent of the delta variant and and even more so since omicron hit we began seeing many more breakthrough infections so people who'd had one or two or sometimes even three doses of vaccine, they were getting COVID anyway. Because it's a little more neutral than, than super immunity, um, the term hybrid immunity is now the one that researchers generally use to describe when someone has both had the virus and been vaccinated, regardless of the order in which that happened. Um, so how effective is hybrid immunity? Well, let's get the caveats out of the way first. Um, immunity is, of course, individual. And, and some people, like the elderly and immunocompromised, and them, experts say, even the double whammy of a vaccine course, plus having COVID-19, that that probably won't provide the kind of forever resistance that, that one would hope. Um, there's also the problem of possible new variants appearing and whether existing immunity might protect against them as well. Um, a young member of my family, for instance, had what was almost certainly the Delta variant last summer after having had one shot. Uh, then she got a second shot in the fall, but she still contracted what was very likely Omicron over Christmas, uh, despite 
her hybrid immunity. On the positive side, though, um, what was true for her also appears to be true for most people who have some form of hybrid immunity, which is that that second infection was very mild. Um, experts say that's because the combination of naturally acquired immunity and vaccine acquired immunity, that it provokes a more powerful antibody response and also an in-depth immunological response than that seen in those who have either only been vaccinated or who have only recovered from an infection. So hybrid immunity, they say, should protect most people well um, against subsequent exposures, uh, at least in the short term. Still, authorities warn that it's a bad idea to expose yourself on purpose to the virus after being vaccinated with the goal of acquiring hybrid immunity. Um, first, because there are no guarantees that you'll have a mild case. And second, because you might end up giving it to others. And, and third, because we still know just too little about long COVID after breakthrough infections. According to the World Health Organization, some 300 COVID vaccines are under development worldwide. Turkey recently gave the green light for a locally made inactivated vaccine, which is already being used as a booster shot. But there are still questions surrounding its effectiveness. Our correspondent Yulia Han reports from Istanbul. Queuing for a world premiere. At this Istanbul hospital, people have been receiving the Turkovac vaccine since the beginning of the year. The first COVID-19 jab developed and produced in Turkey. I have more trust in Turkovac than in other vaccines because it's made by my own country. I wish they had launched Turkovac sooner. I would have gotten it for all my shots. I haven't been vaccinated at all until today. I waited for Turkovac because I trust our Turkish scientists more than those abroad. For President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Turkovac is a symbol of national strength. With its own vaccine, he says, Turkey is one of the most innovative, progressive countries in the world and no longer dependent on others. Esin Şenol from the country's independent doctors' union criticizes the fact that hardly any data on Turkovac has been published. That is why she isn't recommending the new vaccine. Political success, she says, seems to be more important to the government than scientific accuracy. I can't evaluate how effective this vaccine is because I don't have the necessary information. The results of the phase one and phase two studies have not been published. We also know next to nothing about phase three. Until we have the scientific facts, we can't consider this a vaccine, but just some kind of liquid. As in many countries, Omicron is behind the number of new infections rapidly surging here in Turkey. The vaccination rate is comparatively high. About 85% of adults have received at least two jabs. But the uncertainty surrounding Turkovac is causing concern. We don't know much about Turkovac yet. That's why I don't think it's very safe. I wouldn't take it because I haven't seen scientific data and studies about it. I will get my third dose of BioNTech today. I don't trust the Turkish vaccine. I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. Nurettin Yiğit has overseen Turkovac's development. He says the worries are unfounded. The Turkish vaccine is as safe and effective as others. We have our figures and our studies. We do not have the slightest concern or doubt in terms of its effectiveness. Being vaccinated is better than not being vaccinated at all. If Turkovac helps us convince those who are unvaccinated, that would be one of our greatest achievements. Over the next few months, as many people as possible are expected to also get their booster shots with Turkey's own vaccine. 
And soon, according to the government's plan, Turkovac will be delivered to other countries to help them in the fight against COVID. Our reporters regularly consult experts about the latest research on the coronavirus. For example, how exactly does our immune system respond when it's exposed to the virus? Our reporter Stephanie Zobel spoke to immunologist Reinhold Förster, a researcher at Hanover Medical School, to find out more. Professor Reinhold Förster, thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking about the immune response towards the coronavirus and how it differs depending on whether you're vaccinated or recovered. What's the difference between the immune response after vaccination compared to someone who's already recovered from the disease? After an infection, the immune system tackles the virus in its entirety. Essentially, we develop immune responses to all the virus's components which gives us a fairly broad-based immunity. So what exactly do we need the immune system to respond to? Over the last year and a half, we've been busy trying to induce responses against the spike protein, and our vaccines are based on that. The vaccines only give us an immune response to this relatively large spike protein, but not against the other virus components. This protein was selected because the virus cannot infect cells without it. And if you develop neutralizing antibodies, then they'll have the ability to suppress an infection of cells too. You mentioned a previous infection providing a broader immune response. But what provides the greater immunity, vaccination or natural infection and recovery? And are there individual differences? Well, the differences are relatively big. On the one hand, protection after an infection is broader, but not very deep. There have been a range of studies looking at the immune response among people who've recovered from the virus and comparing it with the response among vaccinated people. And we do see that overall, people who are triple vaccinated have developed a far higher response to at least the spike protein than people who've recovered from an infection. How about combining different immunization options, such as cross-vaccinating with different vaccines, or a previous infection combined with vaccination? And why is hybrid immunity considered particularly effective? An important issue, but we don't really know. We have observed that cross- or hybrid immunization is far better than two or three doses of the same vaccine, as shown in our own studies and others too. We've also seen that people who got infected early on and have then had one or two vaccine shots have an extremely good immune response. This might be because there was enough time after the infection for memory cells to form. And a second or third immunization can then cause these memory cells to multiply very quickly, enabling them to give the body a very high level of protection. What explains the high infection rates with Omicron? And if someone is vaccinated or recovered, does that make a difference? We have to make a distinction here between catching the virus and becoming seriously ill. The Omicron variant had a whole range of mutations to the spike protein the virus needs to infect cells. Immunization creates antibodies, but those are now no longer as effective for inhibiting an infection with Omicron. 
Und das ist der Grund, wieso sich sehr viele Menschen infizieren. And that's why a lot of people are getting infected despite being triple vaccinated. There are studies showing that protection against Omicron disappears around 10 weeks after the third vaccination. But the big difference compared to the unvaccinated is the progression of the illness. And that's where triple vaccinated people are extremely well protected compared to the unvaccinated. Professor Förster, thanks for talking to us. You're welcome. That's all for this week. Join us again next time for a fresh edition of our COVID-19 special. Goodbye for now, and take care.